you know, at one point the judge sort of was like, we could use less details. Thanks. Like I, like she was cautioned <laughs> against all the details she was given. Uh, and, and I had and a counter view on that. That's just, I go against so you not me, and not me. I, I, not more me. Not me. I thought, for me. no, I thought it was good. I, I don't even know. Cause like, the spanking him with the magazine that didn't do anything no, that's, for you? That's, that's what was too out, much? That's been out which there. Detail it, was, which was the tipping point detail for you, Sarah? No, no, J- JBL. I'm not going to. No, <laughs> gross. Hello, everyone. This is JVL here with my best friends, Sarah Longwell and Tim Miller of The Bulwark. Guys, I went away for 48 hours and the whole world is on fire. That's amazing. Uh, Happy 50th, bro. Thank you, guys. You Have guys you recovered, best. like, emotionally? Uh, yeah, are you, how are your endorphins after having to see all those people in Philly and then receiving attention for your birthday? Are, it was like, did great. you need, like, some dark time, or are you okay? Honestly, the best birthday I've ever had. Oh, I love that for you. Did you get Honestly. any cool gifts, maybe? I did. We'll talk about that on The Secret Show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, The Secret Show. Yeah, uh, listen, I want to talk about for that, baby. Ten dollars. Good month. Republicans. So you had on uh, Jeff Duncan yesterday, Tim. Yeah. Who wrote? Was it for the Atlanta Journal Constitution? Was that yeah. where he did his piece? And he was like, "Yeah, I'm going to vote for the guy who I have policy disagreements with, who's a decent human being, who's not going to overturn the uh, the Republic." Which seems like the like saying, "Hey, water is wet." And but it turns out to be incredibly brave because even a guy like Paul Ryan can't do it. Um, I would just like to hear you guys talk a little more ab- about that, Timothy. Can I? Yeah, I'll you do had Jeff, Jeff Duncan first. on, right? Uh, I did. Uh, so it's interesting, and I think that it's just it's worth kind of analyzing this because Jeff Duncan is an interesting specimen because uh, he was on the Tuesday Daily Pod. Uh, Kinzinger is on Wednesday, and 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 you know it, the contrast is interesting. All right, because Kinzinger, God love him, you know, he's still conservative on very views. We'll talk about his, you know, foreign policy, et cetera. But, you know, I mean, look, you get into, you, you start to get turned off by all these crazy freaks in the MAGA world. And every once in a while, you start to sound like Tim and JBL every, every once in a while, not all the time. Not Jeff Duncan. Not Jeff Duncan. Jeff Duncan still holds, like, the what I find to be a delusion. And we talked about this a little bit, that, like, the real GOP is him. You know, he is a true conservative. He was talking about the, uh, uh, you know, some of our listeners, <laughs> some of our lib listeners are going to be like, whoa. And he was talking about the, uh, what do you call the abortion ban from the moment of conception? What's, what's the uh, what's Life the Begins at Conception what's the, Act? What's the, no, is what's that... the term, term of ours on that? Anyway, the very, the you know, a very draconian abortion law he name-checked yesterday uh, on the podcast yesterday. Immigration, he was like bragging on Republicans for how they brought enough pressure to the Biden administration that they came to the table on immigration. I mean, he sounded like a right-wing conservative. And, and I say that not to criticize him because it's like, that to me makes his endorsement of Joe Biden mean more, actually, and and, and it says more about him, you know, better about him. You know, maybe we could it, it might say not as good about his policy and analysis from on certain issues from point time to time. But I think I think from an ethical standpoint and from a judgment standpoint, it says more about him because he's like he's indistinguishable from whatever the most right wing National Review guy is, but he has the courage to be like nope. But I, I, I still think it's better for those of us who have this policy world, this policy framework, this worldview, if we get rid of this guy and if we if we stop the threat to democracy and if we stop debasing our politics. And, and uh, you know, to me, I thought that was very telling. And we're going to need guys like Jeff Duncan in November, mm-hmm. you know, not people, not just people that have you know, gone full resistance. And so I thought that was an interesting part of the conversation that contrasts with, you know, our friend Paul Ryan, for example. Yeah. And look, I'm going to yell about Paul Ryan in a second, but I want to stick with Jeff Duncan because, you know, you say we're going to need him. We have needed guys like him. Like part of what has been so, I, I think going back, right. So let's, and I'll just frame it like this. There's a million ways we could, but let's just take the fact that like Tim and I are a couple of young gay Republicans and these conservatives, we knew we were in a movement with people who did not want us to get married, right? But we also took well, they them were fine their... if we married each other. 
Yeah, Tim and I. That could would have been okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we yeah, faked we it a couple times. We did fake trips. it a couple times. We 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 shared we shared hotel rooms. This guy and I, uh, and then we decided not to get married. Yeah, some people um, in Kansas were like, "That's an interesting couple." <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Who wears the pants in that relationship? <laughs> yeah, we know the answer to that. Uh, and and so 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 Tim and I like understand who these people are, and I think that we had like a slightly uneasy alliance with them. But we did I, even with Santorum, like all these people at the time. I was around a lot of social conservatives, and I disagreed with them on this, and I could argue with them, but I also took them in good faith, right? Molly Hemingway, uh, like these were people. Here's your first mistake that we knew. No, right. but, th- but these were people we knew, and but we, I believed that they sincerely believed in God in character, in this, these rules. And that, that extending, the Constitution. Yeah, the cons- <laughs> and so when you think that they really mean it, right, you're like, okay, well, like, we live in a pluralistic society. It's a big tent party. We can argue about these things. Fine. Uh, the thing that Trump exposed in, I mean, 99% of these people, like everyone but David French, Jeff Duncan, and like five other people, yeah is that they were frauds on this stuff, right? That they didn't care. It didn't matter to them. Uh, I don't even know what did matter to them, like getting hits on Fox News, selling books, uh, and, uh, you know, having access to political power and Trump tweeting about them sometimes. Like, that was the wild thing that I think in 2017 and 2018, I was just really struggling to get my, because a lot of them were never Trump in 2016. And then they all got on board, right? right, right. Like some of them switched early, but not really. Um, only some biggest scumbags switched early. Uh, and then the next layer of scumbags um, watched them. And that's why those are the people who accuse us oftentimes of betraying our principles, uh, which is like, uh-huh. whenever it's like the emperor has no clothes thing, like they're accusing us of the thing that they did. It's like all projection uh, because no, like Jeff Duncan is doing exactly what it looks like to maintain his principles. And also, sorry, my principles were always like rhino squishy. So, right. you know, uh, yeah, I maintain we, that too, but I, no, you... I just think that that is right. Like, and though, and the fact that there've been so few of them, it's been so disappointing is why Jeff Duncan is like this oasis in the desert. You're like, yeah, this is all we're asking for, guys. This is all we're asking for. I'm That's not it. asking you to go full Vote MSNBC, for every other Nicole down, Wallace. Down I'm not Republican. asking you to do that. Yeah, yeah. Vote for every other down ballot Republican. Fine. Sarah, um, before, before I like the bill, by the way, your... came to me. We're, we're taping this oh, earlier than usual. I haven't had Well, that's different than fertilization, though. It is. It is. You were saying conception. Heartbeat is like six weeks, I think. Even still. So before I let you go on Paul Ryan... I would say this. So to, to our lib listeners who seem to think that, like, the perfect end result is a country in which 80 percent of the country, 80 percent of the people vote for Democrats. Um, so that's never going to happen. Ever. Like, it's, it's not not reality. Uh, we are going to continue to be a two party system. And what we need is for both of those parties to be basically healthy. That doesn't mean have your policy preferences. It means be amenable to liberal democracy. Right. And so we need a – there's going to continue to be a Republican Party, however much you might like or not like that. And uh, it would be much, much better if the Jeff Duncans of the world were in charge of it. I don't think, uh, I don't think that's going to happen for various reasons, but we ought to support it and wish for it. And God, God bless Jeff Duncan for doing it. Sarah, go. You know who's okay. not? It's Jeff Duncan. Paul Ryan. <laughs> yeah. So here's here's the thing. Uh, I we have now had a lot of these uh, non endorsements, right? So Paul Ryan came out and said, "I'm not going to endorse Donald Trump. He has terrible character." Um, I tweeted about this, and uh, several. I, I said that you know I made the I made the point, and it, I remain it remains a central point for me about this election, which is if you think Donald Trump is unfit and dangerous. And you are unwilling to vote for the one person who can keep him from the White House. I think that's patently absurd. Uh, Now, several people, so I tweeted that um, because Paul Ryan said he's not going to vote for Trump, but he's going to write somebody in. He's going to write in a Republican. Ooh, I hope Uh, it's Edmund Burke. Tommy Thompson. 
right, whatever. He was like, I don't know who, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, right. And several people on Twitter accused me of, of misinformation because in the exact clip I posted, Paul Ryan did not say unfit and dangerous. Uh, I will just, as I, I pointed them to Google though, where Paul Ryan has said a million times that Donald Trump is unfit to be the president of the United States. Uh, so it's not misinformation. Um, and, and, but, but a whole bunch of people have done this. John Bolton's done this. Mike Pence has done this. Chris My Christie. beloved Mitt Romney has done this so far. Chris Christie. Now, I think Mitt Romney and Chris Christie might get there at some point. Romney so left wanna... the door open. Yeah, I think Romney. I, I probably... believe. So I don't want to. I don't want to uh, criticize. Like I think even Liz Cheney has not gone so far as to endorse Joe Biden yet. But like she's, she's gonna. coming. Yeah. She's gonna. And so, so I don't want to. But like Paul Ryan was making it clear he wasn't. And jo you know, John Bolton has been very similar. Uh, Mike Pence has been very similar. And I got to say that did that posture is morally untenable like you cannot hold it and what's crazy to me or not crazy but like paul ryan name checking character as a qualification the central qualification that trump lacks right before he does this big dodge uh in refusing to say that he will vote for the one person to keep trump out of the white house and that's what i think uh, the jeff duncan thing why it was so important. Jeff Duncan made it very clear that it is not enough to simply not endorse Donald Trump. And, and the thing is, is I, I struggle with this because I don't want to get on people. They're doing the right thing, right? They're, they're by not endorsing Trump. Like it's, it, so it's hard. There, that is so much better than most Republicans, right? Like I, yeah. Chris Sununu and Bill Barr send me into like, throwing the computer out the window, tailspins, watching them rationalize this person that they've been on TV now, that, or in, in the case of Bill Barr in front of the January 6th committee, talking about the Trump tried to coup. Trump tried to coup. Trump yeah. caused the insurrection. Trump tried, yeah. But like they are compelled to vote for him. So they're worse. But at worse. least Trump was in favor of small government. Yeah, they're worse. But the Paul Ryans and the John Boltons and those guys who like refuse to endorse Biden, there's something about that that just still really sticks in my craw. I cannot give them... Can can't get them full credit. Can I maybe help you put points on uh, like a little bit of a uh, narrower point on why Paul Ryan is so enraging in particular? Please. You know, because I do think that there's maybe kind of a category, like you lumped him in right there and you're like saying Mike Pence. And I'm like, I'm not quite as mad at Mike Pence. I'm thinking this in my head. I'm like, why? And, and, and part of the reason kind of why is like, again, going back to your earlier point about if you do have a genuine... Uh, like if you're like you think that abortion is an equal you know moral question to some of these other things i think that there are some folks that have that view uh, you know then I, i'd at least listen to the fact that i can't vote for either for mike pence i don't love it he was the vp though i'm gonna kind of take what i can get from mike pence and and some of these other people i'm not as mad at why am i so mad at paul ryan it's because like Paul Ryan was always the opposite side of Donald Trump. He was never a populist Republican. He was like a classically liberal, you know, traditional, Repu you know, Republican, free markets and free people type guy. You know what and I mean? Like, like let's, was... let's get out our pens and our books and figure out how to get this budget under control and pay yeah. off our debts. And like, Trump is like the opposite. Sing the of song of my heart, Paul right. Ryan. Yeah. And it's the opposite. Trump's the opposite. So that's one right. reason. It's like there's not, in, in a lot of ways, Joe Biden is on a policy level not close to paul ryan but conceivably closer than donald trump or at least in the ballpark right so you can't even make the policy argument for if you're paul ryan that's one number two he's from wisconsin and this was part of my like back and forth with steve hayes where i'm like okay you know if you come to me and you're like i'm in california and i'm a talk radio host and i need to keep my job um okay that's a that's a moral failing and i give you a little a finger wag for that but it's kind of like who cares right what you're what you do or if you're a listener here and or you know the, and like i live in california i would like to register my complaints about joe biden by writing in whatever whatever i, I disagree with that but okay paul ryan lives in wisconsin like this the state of our democracy might very well hinge on wisconsin wisconsin was the tipping point state in each of the last two elections all right so that's number two and number three is he's on the fucking board of fox okay yeah. so do something if, if donald trump is that big of a threat and you can't bring yourself to vote for joe biden at least do something in the thing that you can control that you do have control over that's paying for all of your fancy vacations for your family all right and try to uh bring fox into line a little bit okay or or quit in protest or you know work with the good murdoch kids to try to do a coup i don't know do some do something useful besides sit on a fucking panel with rich people and and get on your high horse 
horse and blow farts and then say, well, actually, when I actually have to do something, like the most I can give you is saying Donald Trump is bad. But then any any follow on from that, any actually action that is required on my part to stop Donald Trump, either in my paid private sector work or my public advocacy, I, I can't go that far. And that's what pisses me off the most about Paul Ryan. So two two things. The first is I'll tell you why it doesn't bother you as much with Mike Pence. And that's because largely we grade these people on what they're risking. Right. And for Mike Pence, the vice president of the guy who just ran for president to not endorse Trump, that's still pushing a lot of chips into the center of the table. Yeah. For Paul Ryan, who's just like gadfly man about town, yesterday's news uh, from a party that no longer exists. For him to say, no, I'm not going to, like, there's no, there's no skin in the game. Like, there's no, you know, if he, if he wants to, to really put something on the line, he would have to say he's voting for Biden. Otherwise, what he's doing doesn't really help. I think that that's part of it. But here's my question for you guys. The reason to say I'm going to write in Edmund Burke or whatever is because you're trying to hold on to your, your bona fides as a, I'm still a Republican. I'm still a good Republican. Why is it? that you can't do what Jeff Duncan does, which is just say, I still believe in all this stuff, and I'm going to vote for every other Republican on my ticket. But at the top, I'm sorry, I'm going to vote for Biden. I'm not a Democrat. I won't do it again, probably ever in my life. But why can't why is that somehow materially different than uh, I'm going to write in Edmund Burke and then vote in for all the other Republicans? What, what, why? What is the difference between those two? So let me this is actually part, but this goes back to my earlier point about like nobody meaning any of it, because here's the thing. I get told all the time on Twitter that I can't be a conservative and vote for Joe Biden. Now, let's leave apart how conservative I even I, I am. Like I said, it was always kind of a rhino squish. But I did believe in and do. I, I continue to believe in limited government, free markets, American leadership in the world, and that character counts. Uh, I still hold a number of conservative uh, positions, certainly economic ones. If ideas matter, if ideas matter, then I still hold those ideas. And therefore, uh, conservatism is a set of ideas, and so that label, like, that is a label for a set of ideas that matter. If ideas don't actually matter, then they're easy to abandon, right? You just change the term of what conservative mm. means, right? You just say, Trump's what it means to be a conservative, which is what happened now. Um, and so this is what I mean by like, it never really mattered to them because if it mattered to them, right? They wouldn't say, you cease to be a conservative by voting for Joe Biden. That wouldn't be the metric. The metric would be the ideas that you hold uh, and the values that you have. You don't betray those values by voting for Joe Biden uh, in the sense, right? There, and this is, this is like the central tension of the people that we fight with is there's sort of a mutual accusation of having abandoned one's fundamental beliefs, like this is baseball crank territory. Uh, and I just maintain assiduously that I am not the one who abandoned my beliefs when Trump pulled the whole thing down, the whole screen off of it. And everybody was like, oh yeah, we'll just go in that direction. It, or we won't oppose it actively in order to hold on to our audiences, in order to hold on to our jobs and what, uh, to be in our tribe. That's when they showed us they didn't mean it. Yeah, I mean, I would say in general, uh, the people who lose their jobs on behalf of their beliefs are not the ones who change them. Just as a, just uh, as a friend. I, I would I, just one other thing to answer your original question, JB. I'll just talk about that. I agree with everything Sarah said. Uh, on top of that, though, why why does it feel better to them to write in Jack Kemp than to vote for Joe Biden? It's because it's about self perception and positioning. Like this is what like this is what it's all about. It's yeah. all about making themselves feel superior. Like really, I mean, it's it's like I am not like these people that have totally not thrown like in with the libs that I hate, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not like the MAGA people that just blindly go along. I'm too I'm too superior to have to choose between these two things. Like, I'm above it. I'm above it all. It's about self. Mm -hmm. It's a self-identity thing almost as much as it is. It just else. makes me appreciate Jeff Duncan more. All right, this episode is sponsored by Factor, which has greatly improved my family's eating life with delicious, ready-to-eat meals that I don't have to cook. 
Uh, it's also improved the lives of everybody at the office because when you open up the fridge over at the, uh, the the HQ, all you see is a wall of meals from Factor, half of which are for Barry because I know Barry is a Factor freak. The warmer, sunnier days keep coming, and you need to fuel up for them with Factor's no prep, no mess meals. If you want to meet your wellness goals in time for summer, use the menu of chef crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you'll always have time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals. Each fresh, never frozen meal is chef crafted, dietitian approved, and ready to go in just two minutes. You'll have over 35 different options to choose from every week. Also, there are more than 60 add-ons to help you stay fueled up and feeling good all day long. Get started today and get after your goals. Factor meals take only two minutes to prep so you can fuel up fast with their restaurant quality meals that are ready to heat and eat whenever you are. You can also discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day like breakfast, midday bites, and more. They have these little little shots of juices and turmeric and stuff. They're delicious. Uh, give you a little boost Tumeric. in the middle of the day. Turmeric. Turmeric. This is Tumeric. your Don Lamont moment Tumeric. here. Tumeric. Whatever. Turmeric. You know what? When Factor does that, it's turmeric. Uh, there's no meal prep, no mess meals. These dishes are ready to heat. No cooking, no cleaning. Uh, they're flexible for your schedule. Get as much or as little as you need by choosing your meals every week. Plus, you can pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, premium options with no cooking required. And they've done the math. Their meals are less expensive than takeout. And every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. Head to factormeals.com slash the next level 50 and use code the next level 50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code the next level 50 at factormeals.com slash the next level 50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. Uh, all right. One of the other things that happened is uh, Eileen Cannon down in the documents case. We'd been previously working under the uh, assumption that she was going to, there was a theoretical trial date for May 20th and that that was going to get pushed off. Uh, and it, that it has been pushed off yesterday. She released a five page order in which she said, uh, yeah, I'll figure out the date for the trial some other time. It's amazing. Uh, there's no, when you read her order, there's no logic to it. There's no argument. It's just sort of a fiat. Uh, and basically it seems like it's because she doesn't have her shit together and there's a huge backlog of unresolved questions and motions before her. And she feels like she has to get all of all of her old homework done. She's got to catch up on her homework before she can schedule a trial date. Uh, the smart legal people that I've been reading say that they now think that she is unlikely to even come back and schedule a date until July. So maybe in July, July, she'll come out and say, sure, let's shoot for November 2027 or something. Um, it's kind of wild. And I, our, our friend, or my friend, I don't know if you guys know David, uh, David Latt, who, uh, writes a fantastic sub stack on, on legal stuff, did a real deep dive on Eileen Cannon maybe a month ago. And his conclusion is that this is a young judge who has simply been overwhelmed by what has been put on her. And has has as a result of getting slapped down by her, her appeals court um basically has had a <laughs> the judicial equivalent of a nervous breakdown in which she has taken everything on herself and is no longer is now micromanaging her clerks her clerks all hate her she had a clerk shortage she had a bunch of people leave and that uh it's not that she's super trumpy but it's that she's she's basically got the yips. Why not both? Yeah. Well, so I'm curious as to, so I guess the question choose? I would have for you guys is, does it matter why? Because if she 
let's pretend that she was just in the in the the tank for Trump. Let's pretend that's what this was. Would she be acting any differently than she's acting now? No, but I do think it matters. What's it saying? You know, don't attribute to malice what can be chalked up to stupidity. Um, sure. I think there's some of that here. Uh, I also think, and this is like uh, George and I are going to tape today, and um, I'm sure we're going to get deep into this. But he's been kind of like, you know, I I was really he he kind of had that same theory. Like this is a young judge in over her head. Uh, you know, I don't want to say that it, she's either dumb or trying to help Trump, but like, I think slowly he's been coming to the conclusion that like, maybe it's a little bit of both, um, that yeah. she and is not both. dumb it, to be clear. The David Latt argument is not like, that, like oh, she's dumb. Uh, it's that she brought sort of not a, she's not a trial judge. And so she brought an appellate mentality and just sort of has created problems for herself because she's overthinking. This is, I want to be clear. We're not saying like, oh, lady maybe, judge isn't maybe. smart. That's not the argument I'm making. Well, yeah, but, you know. Uh, if you want to make I, that, go ahead. But. Well, I just, I always root for the most <laughs> viable woman in any situation. However, sure. uh, this, I don't, I mean, part of it is the thing that she did with the, um, uh, she has made a bunch of decisions. And again, I'm going to, I'll let George explain it. Cause, uh, but like, that are incomprehensible to folks on the legal side. They are like, this doesn't make any sense. This is not a thing that you do. And it's one of those things where it is either malice, but also looks quite a bit like incompetence. Um, and so I think the question of like, does it matter is a pretty good one. Cause I'm not sure. It, well, I think it matters in terms of like the moral energy of the universe. Uh, but I'm the, the outcome is going to be yeah. what it is. And I think the outcome here is that uh, one of the most slam dunk cases against Trump that is serious. And not that the hush money is not serious, but that is like deeply serious and relevant to Trump's fitness as the president is not going to get tried before the election because of this woman. Yeah. And she's going to get on a Supreme Court when Trump's the president again. So we can look forward to that. Well, this is where that's where I wanted to go. So, yeah, obviously this sucks and it's very depressing and, and it's a miscarriage of justice, et cetera. Um, but to me, the more interesting side of this is we, we've seen more on the political side, um, the debasement and the quality of people that are willing to, willing to run as Republicans, right, during the Trump time, because good people don't want to deal with this bullshit, right? And so you get either idiots or complete sociopaths, right? Or, you know, you get this combination of people with these bad traits that are drawn like, you know, fl moths to the flame of Donald Trump. And who, and you're seeing this at every level on the political side, state Senate, state legislature, Congress. And we always had, there were always some stupid Republicans out there at every level, but just like the ratio is off. And and it felt like for a while that the on the judicial appointment side, since Trump outsourced so much of that, it was I, a little bit protect, you know, it was, you know, the quality control was maybe not quite as bad as it was on the political side. Now, there were some bad signs. There's like that guy in Alabama that was posting on the Alabama message board about like, I don't know, it's really dumb stuff that was totally unqualified. Uh, so there were a couple examples of, of, of people that were unqualified as they rushed. But I do wonder if you look to a second Trump term, the Eileen Cannon thing, I do wonder if the, the judicial appointments are another area where we will see, you know, the quality of person just absolutely tank. In addition to the bureaucrats, in a like there are all these other <clears> ramifications. <throat> this also ties to the Jeff Duncan conversation that none of the Trump apologists want to like take any responsibility for. But there's all like you know when you when you cont have a contaminant at the top of the chain, like there are gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of contamination all the way down in different areas. And I do think that Eileen Cannon is an example of that. Let me, let me tell you something. Yeah. Uh, in the same way that Donald Trump didn't need Mike Pence this time around because he had all the, the Christian evangelical types with him. He don't need Leonard Leo. Donald Trump don't need Leonard Leo anymore. And he don't need the Federal Society. He had to like prostrate him. Do you remember his list of 10? I've, I have a list of 10 justices and they those are the only people I'll pick from for my Supreme Court. That's his entire thing is going to be when he appoints just, judges in a second term. It's going to be people who will make sure that I don't go to jail. Yeah. That's going to be his only qualification, and the Federal Society can go suck a lemon. Uh, it's, it is wild. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I would say, how interesting, 
that uh, you know, I remember when the indictments first started coming down, there was a lot of angst from people who about the Alvin Bragg case. It was like, oh, it's so unfortunate that this was the first one. This is the weakest of them. It you know, it really would have been better if his, either this case hadn't been brought or if this one had been last. We are going to go to the election, and the only case in which there will be a verdict will be the Alvin Bragg case, in which I think Trump is going to be found guilty, and in which the case itself has been very strong. Like, very, very strong. The prosecution is over-delivered at every turn. And yesterday, Stormy Daniels took the took the stand and I, Sarah, your conversation with George, George and I are in the exact same place on this, right? He also, I think like you and like me, was a little reticent going into this thing. And the prosecution is just over-delivered and has laid out a very, very solid argument with solid evidence. And there doesn't even seem to be, as George said, a defense, right? The defense's job is to present some sort of alternate theory and the alternate theory seems to be just uh, he's Trump. Don't don't do this. Don't don't find him guilty because he's Trump. Um, what do you guys make of the stormy stuff yesterday? Uh, it was gross. And, uh, you know, at one point, the judge sort of was like, we could use less details. Thanks. <laughs> like I like she was cautioned <laughs> against all the details she was given. Uh, and, and I have and a actually, counter view on that. That's just I go against. So not you me, and not, me. I, I, not, not me. I not me. I thought for me. No, I thought it was good. I I don't even know because like the spanking him with the magazine that didn't do anything. No, for that's, you? that's what was too out, much. That's been out which there. Which detail it, was? T- which was the tipping point detail for you, Sarah? No, no, J- JBL. I'm not gonna. No, <laughs> gross. I there's that's called entrapment. You. I know. <laughs> uh, the the best testimony is the business testimony. It's the, it's the Pecker. It's yeah. the... Davidson. Uh, the guys. Yeah. I think the Stormy stuff was kind of a distraction. I think it brings it back to the tawdry, uh, you know, titillating sort of gross element uh, that doesn't bring out the best in everyone. And uh, you are not... You are not prosecuting Trump for having sex outside of his marriage uh, with this person who I don't think any of us need to lionize. Uh, You are prosecuting Trump for an election violation and passing bad checks. And I think that focusing on that part is better and makes it more serious. Uh, And I could have done without the Stormy Daniels. Counterpoint. You do have to prove to the jury that it happened. Right. Because I mean, you, you do have to establish to the jury that this is a real thing that happened. Because otherwise, Trump could then say, and I never even nailed the broad, yeah. right? And, sure. and, and so that, that's, that's why a, you again, have to go into That's again why the less here. is more, though. I think all you needed was for Stormy to like be credible enough. I don't think you needed all of the color. I guess, I, I guess I'm going to take a counter view, and not just on the titillating part, but just I, um, both on the legal and the political side. I feel like... Again, since Trump doesn't have a defense, since it's throwing shit against the wall, the defense is kind of like, I didn't do it. And if I did do it, then it still isn't a crime, you know. So you do have to, to cover the if I did it part. Um, and uh, and so I, I do think she had to be there. I, I'll be interested in hearing George's take, um, being in the room. And Ben with us, I'll talk to also uh, later this week, who was up there. Um, but I, I, from just the narrative and political side of things, like what Donald Trump did was horrific, and I and I I don't know that I need, you need to lionize Stormy to say a positive thing. Like she didn't go like the glory. She testified that Gloria Allred tried to get her to accuse Trump of rape, and she wouldn't do it because she was like, I don't. I, I felt like I, it was consensual, even though when you play out the situation, it's like rape adjacent. I mean, she comes out of the bathroom. She she told him to change. They thought they were gonna get a drink. He's on the bed. She walks out, and he's like, he's like, don't you want to be a director? You know, he does the powerful man thing to her, and 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 there's security. And she said, I thought about how there's security outside the door. It's at minimum a grotesque effort by a disgusting, powerful man to pressure a woman to sleep with him. And 
I don't know. Maybe that doesn't matter in the political scene anymore. Maybe people just are like are cool with that, but um, I'm not. And uh, and maybe that there's some other people out there that would hear that story again and hear the details, and they're like, man, I knew he was a cad, but like this is bad. And oh, by the way, he also admitted to grabbing women by the pussy and knee jink, and he's been a he's been adjudicated rapist. I, I don't know. Anyway, I just think that that story to me is. You know, when it's shorthanded, it's like, oh, he fucked a porn star. But, like, the real story is, like, he pressured a woman who was trying to improve her career into sleeping with her, so him in the so grossest you say, way imaginable. When you say CAD, that is, that, that conjures up the image of this charming Lothario yeah. who is just, you know, basically like Pierce Brosnan. You know, right. He's just so <laughs> suave and charming that women just fall into bed with him. And the reality, I think there's people tend to think that about Trump, but the reality is much closer to Harvey Weinstein. It's like, you know, oh, don't you don't you want to get somewhere? Then come over and get on this. And that's that's different. Yucky. Right. It, it's, it's not cool. Maybe, I mean, maybe not different in a way that matters to anybody except us, but it is different. Right. It's not like, oh, he's just so charming like Errol Flynn, he was out there, and the 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 dames just fell over for him. Yeah. It was that he's this gross, fat old dude who was telling people, "Oh, so you want to direct? Yeah. Well, you know, then you know what you got to do." Have you ever been in the reality TV industry? Yeah, they, he was. He was no, listen, Trump is one of the most vile, disgusting, sexual, sexually predatory people. I just think that, like, in the context of everything. We've seen a lot of Stormy Daniels going on late night shows, telling these stories for laughs. Um, and I Thanks. I think that for this case, uh, I think like the, the retelling of all the lore details as we've dealt with it. I mean, like the guy who was her lawyer in this whole thing became a MSNBC celebrity for a period of time. And then stole all her money and went to jail like and is now pro-trump i'm not saying she's a bad i'm not gonna like i don't know about i don't know her person it's just like it's all pretty scummy right and so i think what you're really trying to do is make sure you nail trump on uh like the goal of this case right is nailing trump yeah. on the business and election fraud and like that's what we're trying to do here. So I well, don't then know. she should be sandwiched in, right? And she's sandwiched in between the business stuff and and the more business stuff. We're going to get to Michael. Cohen. You know that might be true. That that yeah. might be true. That like that the fact that you just kind of have her in the middle here as another witness is the right thing to do. I just I do think the fact that they had to take her out and be like you need to say less about this is like that's where they should have gone the whole time. Is kind of okay. like the stormy part of it is like do what you need to do to establish this really happened and then get off the stand. As like a court TV level legal analyst, the only other thing that was fun for me yesterday was like because she was getting too much into the lower details, I guess, the uh, Trump side tried to throw the case. <laughs> yeah, tried to get a mistrial. <laughs> and like when they asked the judge for it, the judge was like, bro, you know you're allowed to object during the testimony. I was like, have you, you, know, have you ever watched Boston Legal? Like, uh, you know, he's like, <laughs> he's like, every time she said something, you could have objected at that time and the judge was like i had to interject at one time because she was going too far outside of scope i was in judges like i was doing your job for you and now you want a mistrial no do be a better lawyer i did kind of enjoy that all right mm -hmm. uh before we move on we have another sponsor tim take it away we do and that sponsor is z biotics let's face it after a weekend at Jazz Fest, you don't always bounce back the next day, which means you sadly have to make a choice. You can either have a great night or a great morning. That is, if you haven't found Zbiotics, Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works: when you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this pro byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic produces an enzyme to break this byproduct product down. Just remember to make Z-Biotics pre-alcohol drink your first drink of the night. Drink responsibly and you will feel your best tomorrow. I don't know if you guys know this, but Jazz Fest happens for eight days. Eight days. Is this like a second Mardi Gras? Yeah, they just do things different down here, y'all. They just do things different in New Orleans. And um, 
you know, I have to, I got to pace myself. I got a daily podcast now. And the idea of going out to Jazz Fest for eight days. The other thing is, thanks to this ad sponsor, I've had a couple commenters in the YouTube. They're like, you drink a lot. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, do I? I guess, kind of. But I just have to mention every time I drink now to tell you about Z-Biotics. Um, and so, you know, I went I out mean, a couple I feel days. Like I didn't do eight days. By the scale of New Orleans, you're, you're practically a teetotaler. Exactly. Exactly. Right. You're, a, you're an you, amateur Gil. by New Orleans standards. I, and I was a Jazz Fest amateur uh, compared to my friends that were doing eight days out there. I, I only did a few. It was nice to see some Bulwark people out there. A lot of Bulwark love at Jazz Fest. But, um, uh, you know, I, I, I have to credit pacing myself, but also z for making sure that I felt better after I had a couple of daiquiris out of Jazz Fest along with that crawfish strudel. Vacations, weddings, birthdays, reunions, music festivals. There's so much going on. Get the most out of your spring plans by stocking up on pre-alcohol now. Go to zbiotics.com slash next level to get 15% off your first order when you use next level at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash next level and use the code next level at checkout for 15 percent off thank you zbiotics for sponsoring this episode and my good times all right uh we're coming up because we got a hard out today so we're, we're running a little short on time very quickly people was there love any it Christy when we cut the show short you know they're just they want this is a short party. you're gonna get a full-size show people i'm just saying that we don't have time to do all of the all of the topics so i want to do the we'll end with tim scott and doug Burgum. uh did anything happen with Christy Nome while I was away? Did she shoot anyone else? Did she murder any other small? Did she kill bunnies? Herself in the foot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. She, she, she put herself down, so to speak, um, uh, over the course of various interviews. Um, I don't. What do you do? Actually, I'm. I'm curious. Before, well, let me tell JVL what happened since he wasn't paying attention, and then I'm curious to Sarah's view as somebody that used to do PR for book tours. Because what do you do in this situation? The book comes out. She's already like wall to wall. She's she's pre booked, right? She has multiple Fox interviews, CBS this morning. She's on the Sunday shows, and like every interview is about either lying about meeting Kim Jong Un. Or the spree of dog murders that she's proposing, following, following the one that she's executed. Did on. she? Am I? In, am I? Do I have this right that she basically demanded that Joe Biden Put kill commander? commander? Yeah, she demanded the commander be executed as well, and said that that's what a okay. responsible leader would do. Um, so anyway, she wow. has all these interviews booked. They're all terrible. Even the Fox ones are going terrible. The only good one that she had, good quote unquote, was on over on Newsmax. Eric Bolin gave her the nice treatment. He he posited that maybe, just maybe, the book editor was a liberal plant. And mm. Christy got to say, you know, Eric, that's an interesting theory, but I, t I, I take responsibility. So she got to take the high road. So she had one good interview with Eric Bolin. But over on Fox, not quite as friendly. Uh, the Stuart Vardy interview got so on Fox Business. Like, why, why are you doing this Fox Business interview? No one's going to buy a book based on this anyway. No one watches Fox Business. But Stuart Varney interview, like, literally ends with him having to say, well, I'm sorry. This is just what people are talking about. And, sh and like, we're out of time. Like, they, he didn't have a ch chance to get to anything except for the dog and Kim Jong-un. And she got very flustered by that. She can't. She finally cancels an interview with Greg Gutfeld. Uh, for Gutfeld's late night show, and so and so Gutfeld replaces her with Dana Perino, who pretends to be Christy Nome, and they make fun of her. Like that is wow. bad. Imagine how bad of a place you have to be in a, a, as a Republican to get roasted on the Gutfeld show Jeez. Um, in a skit. So things not going great for Christy Nome, and uh, and that's that's the update for you, JVL. Though I do back to my question for Sarah. Like I, I I was just thinking about this all day, not all day, but a few times yesterday. I was like, what would I have done? If she was my client, I think that you cancel the interview. I think that the one article about the interviews being canceled is superior to just the ritual humiliation that she put herself through. I don't know. What say you? And I think that's an old school conventional way to think about this. Drum I think roll. Christy Nome is doing this doing. She's running the MAGA playbook. Just let her the MAGA playbook is that you do not apologize. You do not stand down. I do not agree that she is tanking her prospects as a Trump VP by doing this. I think she is accelerating them. I'm sorry. I actually think she is right now. She is Wait, saying, no, Siri, is this she's a bit? saying, she's saying, I shot the dog on Fifth Avenue. Okay. You want to show, you want to see grit? Not only did I shoot the dog, I'm going to defend shooting the dog. I'm going to go on TV and I'm going to, I'm going to just own all this 
and I'm going to look good while I'm doing it. I, I just, I, I think um, there's no room for advisors and PR anymore. There's no damage control. There's only leaning in uh, and, and, and showing. Until you turn into a corn cob. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I, I think the Kim Jong Un thing is actually harder than the dog shooting. It is because I think you can brazen out the dog shooting. <laughs> you can't like her tack on the Kim Jong Un thing seems untenable. It seems to be uh, she simply won't acknowledge. She's like, "Yep, we uh, we made some corrections to the book, and I won't talk about my conversations with world leaders," which is like a half. It's like a modified hangout. She's not saying that it didn't happen, but she's not not saying it didn't happen. <laughs> Jesse Waters was kind of like, blink twice if you actually did meet him and did <laughs> He didn't say it like that, but like literally he was like doing everything possible to let her, to bail her out of that. Like, it's kind of like, so are you saying you might have met with him? And, you know, he, she just couldn't get there. Uh, uh, there were people in the focus <laughs> groups, you know, Christy Noem has been like a top person that people say about who trump should pick for vp yeah just for a long long time yeah. um she's well, been reason, a rising wait, star but is that, and, was that a bit or do you, you really think she's helped herself in the vp no stakes? i don't think she's helped herself i do think i do think this is the play though like i in 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 the new world yeah, like the idea of cowering and not going on her book tour like this book's gonna be and you know who I learned this from, Tim? I learned it from you. I remember when I said this to you. I said this to you, and you could tell me if it was. But I asked you back when Sean Spicer was doing the the role of when he was the spokesperson. Yeah. And uh, I knew Sean very little, but you knew him much better. And I was like, what is this guy doing? And then it was, and you were like, he's going to be a star. He's going to get his own TV show. He's going to, and like, I was like, no, this is going to, I was like, it's going to ruin his career. It's going to be the end of him. And you said, no, he's going to be a star. And then what happened? He left. He was on Dancing with the Stars, got his own Newsmax chair. I mean, he's kind of now faded into obscurity, probably because he's not MAGA enough in real life. He like, and he's not also Mr. Personality. I think Personality. he's still doing the, the Village's book, you know, the Village's tour. I think he still gets, you know, hired to be the, you know, Waukesha County GOP keynote speaker at the, you know, Trump Reagan dinner that they've renamed. Sure. Like, I think he still gets those kind of gigs. Yeah. But so anyway, my point is, my point is uh, that, that this is what you do now is the, is you lean in. She's going to make a lot of money from the books and like eventually I just, I just think about Trump. Trump's, tr think about the Stormy Daniels thing. Think about the Access Hollywood tape. Access Hollywood tape breaks and everybody says, you're done. This guy's done. Paul Ryan pulls out of appearing with him, everything. Trump says no. And Steve Bannon says no. We're going we're gonna to push through this. And then everybody forgets. You think people are going to remember six months from now that Christy yeah. Nome? they might remember the dog thing. She's not going to remember that she didn't meet Kim Jong-un or whatever. Um, they're going to remember the dog thing and it probably did tank her chances like at actually being VP, but I don't think it tanks her career. And I think that's the calculation, right? I think she lives to shoot more dogs. I totally agree. Uh, all right. So over the weekend, Tim Scott and Doug Burgum went on the shows and, uh, you had a long, very good discussion about this with, uh, Edgar and Bill Crystal. On, on Monday, Tim. I, and then I, I stepped I, in for you in the triad and wrote uh, and <clears throat> wrote even ex more extended thoughts. I on haven't. It. I have. So I haven't read it. Okay. Well, you know, that's how fine. Does it feel? But, that, but anyway, how does that that's feel, me Tim? saying I've given all I have to give on this topic. So I want to hear what you have, to, what you think about it. So I was going to save this for me and Sarah for Friday, but I, I just can't. Um, the first thing I want to say before I just pass the baton over to you, Sarah, is Kristen Welker. Kristen Welker is not doing her job very well. And uh, I, I would point her to well, have a look at George Stephanopoulos. So she she asks Tim Scott this question about, will you, you know, will you uh, recognize the legitimacy of the election if Biden wins? And Scott won't answer. And she asks it like three different ways. And he says, you can spend all of our time on this if you want, but I've given you the answer I'm going to give you. And so what she should have done was spent the entire rest of the interview asking that question over 
and over and making Tim Scott say his ridiculous statement over and over. Yeah. And any time you you agree to move on on a question like this, the the interviewee wins. And that drove me crazy. I was just like, okay, spend the whole rest nine minutes. That's what, that's what uh, what what uh, Stephanopoulos did to, to Chris Sununu, right? And spent nine minutes on that question, and this is what should be incumbent on I mean, Kristen every did spend TV. Spend like three and a half minutes on it. That's pretty not good. enough. Not enough. Don't move on. And this is, I think, incumbent on every single TV talking head interviewer um, I... for the rest of the way. The but Sarah, I, I want to hear you go. No, 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 just the thing that I really agree with, I, I don't know about spending a full nine minutes on it. I do think saying out loud from her perspective that this is essential. Like, this is essential for the American people to know. I think you owe them a, like, you owe them your position on certifying elections. It's central to democracy. So what is your position? Like, and I, I, I think it kind of doing more to try and box them in uh, I do think is important. Um, you know, some of times, like if they're just going to refuse to answer, uh, but you also have to like hang them for doing that. You have to be like, okay, so what you're telling me is that you're not going to tell the American people whether or not you would certify an election, uh, if you didn't like the results, just to be clear, that's what you're telling me. Yes or no. Uh, and I just, I do think they have to push harder. So what did you think of uh, Tim Scott, the good Republican, Mr. Happy Future, you know, Reagan, sunny optimism? He is desperate to, desperate to get on this ticket, isn't he? Yeah, and it's, I mean, these, I, I, I'm watching, it's these, these days, you know, it's just every day is who are, where are the heroes? Like Jeff Duncan, right? Every day, uh, and, and we need more of those. Uh, but more days you see people debase themselves and, uh, you know, I, I, we've all used it's, I, I might've already used it once in this, uh, podcast, but the emperor has no clothes thing. It's like, I think about it all the time. I never run it. You know, when you're a kid and you hear that story, you like, get it. You're like, it's about conformity and whatever, but like, it's actually something much deeper and more pernicious than that. It's about refusing to like acknowledge truth. It's creating a different reality and trying to force other people to live in it with you so that you can gaslight them uh, and you don't have to you don't have to live by rules of morality or um, our common social norms because you construct an alternate reality that you demand other people live in. And like it really is uh, the most topsy turvy insanity. And it means that Tim Scott's a bad person like these are bad people do this. I'm not going to top that. Uh, guys, good show. Long show. It was great to be back with you. And Sarah, you and I will be together on Friday. Can't Thanks wait. a lot. See you guys. Peace. Bye.